What's happening? Thanks for joining us in the Wong Notes podcast today. My name is Corey Wong. I am your host. Today is a very special episode for me because I get to interview one of my absolute heroes. And when I say that, I actually meant it more than just musically because the first time I saw Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones live, I was a teenager. I saw them at the Minnesota Zoo Amphitheater. And for some reason that night, the music they played and the way they played, the way that it just connected with me emotionally, in some way, it gave me permission to do music the way that I do it now. And that sounds so weird and I don't know how I got there or how that transpired in me. And I don't know whether that was their intention. I think they were just there to play a fun show. But the music touched me in such a way that I really connected. It was a fork in the road for me. I, I decided that music was going to be my life after seeing them. And that's such a weird and crazy thing. But hey, I can't explain it. It just is what it is. Bela Fleck, incredible musician. There are very few people in the world and very few instruments that are out there that have this thing where you say an instrument and the general population thinks of one person because of their impact on that instrument. Cello. Yo-Yo Ma, mandolin, Chris Thiele, banjo, Bela Flack. I'm trying to think of other things like that. I know there's a couple other instruments, whatever. Fact of the matter is, he is the top of the game on the banjo, and he's incredible. And by the way, he grew up in New York City. He went to high school. His high school band, he had a thing with Marcus Miller, Omar Hakim, with Kenny Washington. This is insane. I can't believe that that was a high school class. It almost just seems unfair to have that much talent in one high school. But anyways, we're going to get into it. Let's hit it. All right, folks, you're listening to a guitar podcast. What does that mean? I'm going to talk a little bit about guitar gear. Okay. Now, this podcast is presented by Fender and Premier Guitar Magazine. So today we're talking about that Fender Player Series. Fender is stoked to welcome the Duo Sonic Mustang and Mustang Bass to the Player Series family. Shorter scale necks, cool asymmetrical shape, classic Fender colors. It's a win, win, win. I personally have a Mustang PJ Bass out of the Player Series and I love it. That one, it's my personal favorite out of the basses there because I can get the J sound with the bridge pickup and I can get more of the P sound with the neck pickup and the middle is a nice little blend. As far as the guitars go, the Duo Sonic, the Mustang, cool designs. Obviously, everybody, come on, we're guitar players. You're familiar with the Stratocaster, you're familiar with the Telecaster, but don't let your research stop there. Designed for authentic Fender tone with a bit of an edge, Alnico single coils, split coil and humbucking pickups. You get your foot in the past while looking to the future of guitar tone. Now, what I would suggest, try to go to a Fender dealer, see if you can get your hands on one of these necks, because the modern C-shape is really cool. Fits really nice in my hand. If you can't get to a Fender dealer, check out the website. If you have any other Fender guitar that you can reference, there's a really cool diagram where you can see the shapes of all the Fender necks and the styles of necks. This one, really comfortable, very playable. I love the modern C-shape neck. Now, I talked about the Mustang, Mustang bass, Duo Sonic, but yes, they've got the Telecaster. They've got the Stratocaster with the kind of specifications across the player series. So go check it out. If you're curious, hit Fender.com. You can see a whole array of things there. Check out their YouTube page. Dig it. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. This is really fun. The first time I ever heard you, I heard you from the other room. A friend of mine was playing a Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones live at the Quick DVD. And I thought, whoa, what's that guitar player? Like, that's a cool sound. What is that? He's like, dude, it's a banjo. It's an electric banjo. And then I, I've been hooked ever since. So, Well, I don't know what to say about that, but okay. Now, usually <laughs> people ask me a lot of the times, why don't you play guitar if you're going to play that kind of stuff? And I said, why would anybody play the guitar when they could play the banjo? <laughs> <laughs> we get a lot of, a lot of crap as, as banjo players, so we have to kick back once in a while. Yeah. Well, your name has kind of become synonymous with Bad the and <laughs> with with the instrument and you've clearly become a master of the craft and there's very few people that have that sort of thing where they have such a strong 
I don't know, market share in an instrument. <laughs> and you've spent so much time developing what you do. There's so many different projects. There's so many different styles of music that you play. There's so many different approaches that I've heard you do. I'd love to, to hear you talk about some of those today. But in general, what does it mean and what does it take in your eyes conceptually? This is, this is a kind of broad question. What does it take to become a master of your craft? What does it take to become a master of an instrument? That's a good question. I, um, for me, I, I love that there's a guy named Kenny Werner. You know Kenny Werner? Yeah. Jazz piano player. And he talks about effortless mastery. Yeah. Um, that's only one kind of mastery. But I, I like to uh, check out the guys like, um, there's a few people in my life that are, are like that. Um, one is a guy I was just on the phone with, Tumani Giabate. Everything he plays on the core, it just feels like it's, it just comes out perfect. There's no effort. Um, Zakir Hussein is this way. Mm -hmm. You play with him, it's just like butter. And it's just, it just flows as there's, you don't have that sense of, of battling your instrument. Um, and a lot of the people I play with are, are like that. Chick Korea is another guy. Like I'm, I'm, I'm name dropping like crazy here. Um, if you know who they all are, then you, you know that I'm name dropping. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, um, that's kind of what I, I've realized. Um, I kind of like this idea of, um, you know, the way you get to effortless mastery is, um, is by not trying to play the hardest thing you played all the time, which I used to be very guilty of trying mm -hmm. really hard to do the most complicated, the most the, working at, at the 90th percentage point of what's possible for you to do, which means that you're always struggling. And when I watch some of these guys play and I think, you know, this, he's playing at like probably 40% of his ability. You know, mm -hmm. when Zakir is playing with me, he's not working very hard. Yeah. When he plays with some of his Indian guys, maybe he goes to the, or McLaughlin, you know, maybe he has to go to the next gear, but he doesn't even break a sweat playing the most ridiculous stuff. But that's one piece of it. But I think another piece of it, and there's a guy I played a bunch with named Marcus Roberts, and he talks about the unconscious kicking in, you know, to where a lot of stuff is happening that you don't plan. Um, and you, you can be so spontaneous because you relax, you, you, you hand control over to your subconscious rather mm -hmm. than being in control of every, you know, every note you're playing, hanging on to control. I got to play this. I got to play that. Oh, I didn't play that. That sucks. Oh, I wanted to do this. It didn't happen. Now I'm bummed out. Instead, it's like handing it over to your subconscious to handle things. And, um, and that can be both in, in composition or, or, uh, or, or in live playing. But I think people who have some good uh, relationship with their unconscious, um, are, there's a mastering quality to that, you know, masterful quality to that because the magic comes in. Would that be another kind of word or another something similar to just instincts? I think um, there's something really powerful about us doing all this work, all this practice, and then you just let go. Mm. And some people are really good at doing the work and getting everything precise, but then um, they have a hard time letting go and just letting things happen yeah. on their own with no, with no plan or, or, or having a very rough plan and then allowing the rest to fill in on its own. I guess I'm thinking about improvising when I'm talking about this kind of mastery. Yeah. Um, you, I've heard um, uh, people say like, even I think Herbie Hancock saying something like it's kind of brave to walk out on stage with nothing. Like I, I like to walk on stage with some really solid um, structures and then improvise around those structures. Cause then I know if I'm having a bad day, at least I'm bringing the people, those structures that I can stand behind and I know, I know they're good. Like the tunes yeah. that I've written with the flectones or yeah. our arrangements. And if I'm having a bad day soloing, improvising, cause, cause I can't get my unconscious to take over properly or the sound is weird or whatever. Maybe one of the other guys is having a great day and the audience is still getting a great concert. It takes a lot of nerve to walk out on stage with nothing mm -hmm. and just, and, 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 and create an opportunity for magic to strike. Do you do that very often? Uh, I, I do that sometimes. Like when I do my solo shows, a lot of times the first thing I do is I walk out and I, I play freely. And yeah. if it's happening, I could go for 20, 25 minutes with no, without a plan. Yeah. And if I start to get uh, tense and my, my, you know, my ego or whatever takes over, then I have my songs I can go to, my pieces, my set pieces and my things that I can do. And then I go back into, it's a very different mode. It's like a technical mode where you're like trying to play something you've created, like a classical piece or a piece from Africa, wherever, you know, a piece of Bach or Chopin or, or something where every note is set. And it's a different, very different mindset than improvising. And often once I start playing set pieces, it's very hard for me to go back to improvising Yeah, at this point in my life. But so I usually start and sort of see what happens. And if I'm feeling really loose and flowing, I try and keep it going as long as possible before I try start playing set pieces on solo show. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. I think one of the things there is just getting above certain things. So the first thing you talked about was getting above 
what you actually need or want to play on a gig, getting your technical facility to a place where you don't need all of it. You have reserve in the tank. And also your ideas and things that you've worked on, being able to have those and then in some way transcending above those ideas and just letting your instincts and your subconscious go. We've all been in the band or been the person who's worked on that lick and tries to force it in at night. And then it, we just know it's just like, oh, you clearly practiced that and are trying to get it out. And then you try it again. It's like, wait, wait, what are you doing? You just played that. Like, oh, but I, but I, but I worked on this. I want to get it out. That to me doesn't feel like mastery. So I love hearing what you're saying. It's another thing. So think about what a classical musician does who's not improvising and they're playing set music and they're the experts at that kind of work. Yeah, you know, they, they rarely go to improvising. It's rare for those guys to go to improvising. Um, so the, the problem comes more when you go back and forth between the two. So if all you were doing mm. was execution oriented stuff, I mean, they find a way to put a lot of life and humanity and, uh, and spontaneity into these set pieces. These, if you're playing classical music, you can't change any notes. Yeah. You can play it, change a lot of things about the way you play it. But I just think it's, they're just two different mindsets playing set material. You can get into that mode and I get into that mode when I'm playing my concertos with the orchestra or, or uh, even uh, when I play with Abigail, the pieces are a little more set. Yeah, I'm going to be playing pretty much kind of what what we've created for the piece, uh, and then there's other times when I'm playing with Chick Corea or, or or Zakir or something where you can sort of just wide open, just go uh, with with no plan. And um, but more, more more and more, I mean, I, I really, I really, I don't mind playing to a plan at all. I'm, I I enjoy. I've gotten more comfortable with that over the over the last while. Yeah, um, I don't have to be freely improvising to think I had a good gig. Um, that used to be the center of what I thought was you know hip. For, for me sure. to, to pull off was a, a great improv. And now I guess I'm a little bored with my improvising. I'm, I'm kind of more interested in what can I come up with by really, really working and developing something. Uh, just I'm just as interested in that as I am in what comes spontaneously. Because for me, spontaneous is, is very much about context. Like who am I playing with and what are they feeding me? And then what am I feeding them? And, and it's very conversational. Um, and, then, and that's cool if I'm having a nice conversation with somebody that's, that's interesting, then that's yeah. cool. But it's not so much just improvising as a art above all other things. It's all important. It's all fun. And if you're a complete musician, you're trying to be good at a lot of different things. There's a lot of intangibles in music that create emotional response that makes somebody a great musician that separates MIDI from human. <laughs> and like you're saying, there's certain there's certain pieces that you play that have been played for centuries that in some way could be looked at as data entry, <laughs> where it's the notes and the rhythms are kind of the same every time you play them. What are the things that you rely on most as far as what you bring to the table to bring out your personality in something that's that's such a classic, like you're saying, a Chopin piece or a Bach piece, or maybe it's even just a... A, a solo a solo tune that you've written, how do you bring more of who you are today that makes it sound... Obviously, being played on the banjo is one way that you do it. If I'm playing a classical piece uh, that, I, that I'm the only person that, has, that plays it or that yeah. I'm playing my arrangement of it, then it's kind of like playing almost my own piece. It's my own, it's my own deal. Of course. But, um, well, um, I think there's... You know, you've heard that, that statement, be here now. Mm -hmm. And be here now is a really big piece of it because... Um, I used to think it was, you know, if I heard, if I went to a show and I saw somebody and I saw him do the same show twice and he said the same things, I'd go, oh man, he just is this the same show. It's just a set show, you know, but I've, I've come around on that. And I think that sometimes it's kind of selfish to rate yourself on how spontaneous you were because the people that were there the night before are not the people that are here tonight. And mm -hmm. so if you can commit yourself to the music you're playing and you know, the things you're saying and they're honest for you and they're real for you. And it doesn't matter if you've said them before um, because you can't say something new every single time you, you speak, but you have to make it fresh and alive and really be there, you know, and then it does, it starts to find its own identity, every show and every improvisation and every time. Anyway, um, if you're playing live, you have the room, you know, the room is a big, has a big impact on how you play. Yeah. You know, so if you're in a big live concert hall and you're hearing the reverb coming back to you slowly over a course of time, it makes you play in a more languid way. And you, it's like the banjo has a lot of sustain because yeah. the room gives it to you. But if you're playing in a living room or a, t or a bathroom, you know, you're going to have a very different way of playing it. And, and when you're playing live, you have all different experiences. Every room has its own character. And if you start to um, use that as a you know, as that becomes a factor in, in how you're playing, then that helps you make you play different every night. Yeah. 
I dig that. But 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 if you play a, a jazz club, you know, like, like a jazz club, and you play, you know, five nights in a row, you'll notice the musicians will play, you know, wilder and wilder as the as the week goes on because the 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 environment has not changed. They're in the same environment, so the only way they can make it different for themselves is to approach the music from where they left off the night before and not play it the same way every night. So you you see a lot of growth uh, in any ja- you know when a, j- a good jazz group is in a in a room for five days. You want to go hear them on Sunday night or Saturday night, the last set, and hear hear where they've gotten to. So yeah. The first night they play it kind of like they've been playing it on on their one nighters, but as the second night comes, they start taking more and more risks and going deeper and deeper into possibilities. Yeah, a little more of a unique experience for the room. Yeah, it's you can use it as a, as as a uh, as a launching point too. There's something about folk music in general that feels very honest and organic, and a lot of music that comes from a place that's rooted in tradition feels more organic and honest somehow for whatever reason. There's something about the music that you play that connects much deeper than notes and rhythms. There's certain things in the phrasing. There's certain things in the tone. It transcends scales and arpeggios. There's something that that when I hear you play and and the, hear the groups that you're collaborating with, there's something that makes me more connected to the earth or something. I don't know. Am I crazy? What is what is that? Well, first of all, you, you're a you're a very astute listener. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be. I don't know. You know, I I can't tell you. Um, you know, for me, I just have to play. Um, I, I love the idea that people would think that there's some depth to what I do. I, I want that. Music is the most important thing in my life, except for my family. I don't know what that that is. You know, there's that thing about being yourself, truly being yourself. But um, there's lots of music that has that rootsy feeling. You know, I was just thinking when you said that about some of the funk music and how earthy and powerful it is. And, you know, I just talking to this great African musician and... And it has this ancient, you know, we talk about the ancient tones in the bluegrass world. Um, Ricky Skaggs is the guy who started talking to, about that, you know, about the ancient tones, but uh, in more recent years. But the instruments have these sort of earthy sounds and these hot spots that are, that are louder and that are mysterious on a, on a good mm-hmm. old instrument. You get in a certain range and you play certain strings at the same time or with a closed string and an open string from a high fret or something. And it just some, some magical something comes out of the instrument. And I think if you're aware of that and you're looking for those places um, on your instrument, um, that helps. But also, you know, after the years, you not only you figure what you want to play, you also figure out what you don't want to play. And you start trying to, you know, trying to leave some things that that are less meaningful to you. Let them yeah. go, you know, because you can't keep everything and it's it's not all good. And that's, you know... I mean, I've been able to play the banjo for a long time, but I, I change what, what's important to me changes over the years. Sure. You know, what I care, what I want to play and playing with my wife has, has been a big, of course she's in the room. Uh, she's walking by, but, but it has been a big change in, uh, in my perspective on what I want to play. Sometimes there she's sneaking by. Hi, Abigail. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> she's getting the page from above by the kids, but, um, yeah. So, um, but, but working with her and playing, you know, more kind of, I guess, folk related music with the two banjos, um, and with her singing and not being so much about, um, te- you know, the technical side of what I do, um, has changed, has changed me somewhat and, uh, and about what I care about and what I want to have happening. And when somebody says that I shred on the banjo, I kind of cringe a little bit now where, uh, you know, <laughs> that's never my intention really. Uh, but I, I don't think of, like my heroes, the jazz, great jazz players. I don't think of them as shredders because I think they're playing a lot of, um, you know, meaningful notes. I don't know. It's, it's more than just fing- when I hear shredding, I think fingers just going really fast. Sure. And I'm not against the fingers going fast once in a while. Uh, you know, I like that, but, um, but I don't want that to be the whole thing. I, there, I want something, I want that earthiness. I want something deep about it. And I'm looking for, when I write a piece, I want it to feel like it belongs on the planet for some reason. It's not just, yeah. um, some abstract series of notes. Now, now my son Juno is in the show back there. Hi, Juno. Lightsaber. Yeah. <laughs> as far as that goes, like that, that seems to be a pretty common theme that I hear from musicians who who basically have done the thing and done had a great long career have have reached a certain level of maturity. There's like this 
this wisdom thing that kicks in. And it, it's like the, this, the same, you never hear of somebody like who's been in the game for 30 years saying like, man, you know what I love to do now is just like play as fast as possible. I just love playing fat. Like it's always what, what you're saying is always the case. What, why is that? Is there a certain thing that, that, uh, it's pragmatic because our fingers don't go as fast. So you got to find something <laughs> else to get excited about. But sure. I remember always hearing like in the classical world, um, like when I started doing classical stuff on the banjo, which was really hard, I tried to do the really hard pieces like Paganini and Emoto Perpetuo and some Bach stuff super fast and, and, and um, you know, piano music. And, um, and, and, and it was just, it was just, it was amazing. And it was exciting to, you know, to be able to pull it off when I, when I could, but there was a certain point where I lost my nerve and, um, and I talked to classical musicians and they said, well, you know, you only play those pieces when you're younger. And when you get older, you move towards more romantic material, material where you can bring your life experience into the music, not just try to, you know, play the fastest stuff, let the young kids do that. And so I was thinking, oh, so when you're like a, a classical musician, there's actually, you're taught that there's an arc to it. As you go through life, there's a point, I'm sorry about all of these. I thought I turned it off. I don't quite know how to do it. There's a lot of I'm so sorry, but I guess we're all in the same boat, aren't we? Okay. <laughs> all this machinery we don't know how to use. I know. Um, so yeah, so I like that idea and I'm trying to figure out, I don't want to be, okay, well, here's another example. Bill Monroe, you know, one of the fathers, fathers of bluegrass, they say he's the father of bluegrass, mm -hmm. but I think with when Earl Scruggs and Bill Monroe got together with Earl, with uh, Lester Flatt uh, and the other guys in that band, that's when bluegrass started. Um, but he got to a point when he got older, he, would always, he was always known as the guy who sang in the high keys and played things really fast. And when he got old, like in his 70s, he was having a hard time singing um, Blue Moon of Kentucky in the key of B, but he wouldn't change the key. So mm -hmm. he'd just stay in, he would stay up there and he would, if he was a half step flat, well, so be it, you know? And so people thought, well, that's what bluegrass sounds like. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's not in tune or whatever. Mm -hmm. He's still great. He was still great at an old man, but he, but he didn't gracefully change his, uh, you know, his, uh, his, his modus operandi to, to sure. incorporate the age he had become. So I always thought, I don't want to be like that, trying to play, you know, um, perpetual motion, motor, you know, Paganini at 70 poorly or 80, 70 yeah. is getting a little close. I got to start thinking about 80, but uh, <laughs> so I'd rather find, create music now that suits the way I'm going to be good at playing at this age. And maybe it's going to be more head and less, um, speed, um, as I get older, because it, it is harder to play fast. I'm in, in my 60s, so I can get there. Uh, I can still get pretty much to where I used to get, but it takes longer to get there. I got to warm up a lot more, and I got to be playing that way every day if I'm going to yeah. be playing that way. Um, it's not a problem for Chris Thiele yet, I'll tell you that. He's so great. Yeah, but you know, he's also still in a, in a younger period. Yeah. He'll always be great. But um, yeah. so, you know, in my, as I'm moving into my 60s, I mean, I like playing the folkier stuff with Abby, but I need more of a challenge than that. Uh, and I'm just going to try to write stuff and find music to play the where I can be myself and and still grow and push, but not try to do things that are impossible for me at this age. So I, I'm I'm kind of eyeing that cautiously. Uh, don't want to give up too early either. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot I can do, and I like to do. And then I can bring my my life experience to it in a way that a younger player might not be ready to yet. He can do some things I can't do. Do you think that changes your actual artistic concept? Yeah. As far as the way that you've written from Natural Bridge, Double Time, Flight of the Cosmic Hippo, through uh, the explorations you've had in the last 10 years, is what you're saying, does that affect your artistic vision or is it just the manifestation of how you play it on the instrument? Um, yeah, it comes out different. What, what you're turned on by when you're writing is different. And a lot, for me, a lot of stuff I write by having my banjo in my hands, finding something that excites me and then using my craft to complete that idea. So what sure. I'm really excited about when I was 23 might be some new technique or some way to play super fast. And what I might be interested in now might be more of a harmonic thing or a way to play mm -hmm. a really, uh, get a cool feel or a slow feel or, or, uh, you know, find a neat tuning that, that offers me some new, new sounds or whatever. Um, yeah. So that, that, that makes sense to me. I've noticed also throughout your career, there's tons of collaborations you've done. Seemingly every year or two, it's clear that your vision and your artistic statement is still intact, but the collaborators and people you're playing with, there's been so many, so many duo records actually between you and Abigail, stuff with Tumani Diabate, Edgar Meyer, Chikoria, 
even the the double time record where it's duets, you know, Mark O'Connor, Jerry Douglas, Ricky Skaggs, Mike Marshall, Sam Bush. There's so many duet things that you've done. And there's so many different projects in that realm, aside from Bela Fleck and the Flecktones or your solo material. Is that sort of thing something that you you specifically explore for the sake of your own artistic interest and creative interest, or is it where where does where does what draws you to want to collaborate with those artists, and what do you look for in a collaborator? Um, a collaborator should be able to do a bunch of stuff I can't do that I wish I could do and that I could mm-hmm. learn from, and 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 they have to have something that makes me have to rise up, you know, and 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 pull things out of my butt that I that, that wouldn't normally come. That's what makes me excited about playing with somebody if, if I become different in the collaboration. I'm not, I'm not as interested in mashups where you just, you know, you do what you do, I'll do what we do, and we'll do it at the same time. Yeah. I mean, there's something deeper that happens when you have to go to work on the, the other person's music and, and intuit some things. And, and also the infection of, you know, of, of being in the room together, what happens. But I, I like the idea of making music that sounds complete. And, it, and if there's two people, you've got to figure out how to make it sound complete. Uh, with just two people. And if there's 10 people, you got to figure out how to make it sound complete with 10 people. With 10 people, you play a lot less. You have to leave a lot more room and find your spots. With two people, you get to play all the time, which I like, mm-hmm. actually. Uh, and <laughs> and with the two people, sometimes like with Abigail and the different banjos we play, I get to be the bass player sometimes. I get to play out different roles yeah. in the musical world. Or I get to be the, um, you know, I get to play with a vocalist and be the uh, the person that does the fills with the uh, with the vocal and and the star soloist while she sings when she holds down the groove and I get to be, you know, the I don't know that 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 top layer which I don't normally get to do in my life. So that's that's you know completes me in some other other kind of way. But um, I like I like it if it makes me play different playing with somebody. But um, duets, I think are very intimate. Um, I like music where the person has to figure out how everyone's making all those sounds rather than overdubbing and going, you know, you say, Oh, well, there's 10 banjos on there. No, it's, it's live. It's played with two people in a room. Now me may edit it, get the best version you can get of the song, but it's still played by those people, um, you know, in that room and you, and the the listener can use their, um, their ear to try and figure out what's what. And, and there's something about it that's very magical when you get the right couple of people playing together. Do you typically go on tour with those projects after or before you record them? Um, well, let's see. Um, with Abigail, we went on tour before we recorded mm-hmm. um, and started working on the stuff. Um, with Chick, we went on tour. Actually, we recorded first. We made the record The Enchantment in, I think, three or four days, maybe five days, including mixing, which yeah. was uh, very um, frightening for me. Because I thought we had five days to record. And then when, when I got there, he said, I think we can record it and mix it in five days. I was like, uh, <laughs> okay. And I'm amazed how good the record turned out because sometimes like I am a kind of a control controlling about music. And if I can work and practice and, and, and have a lot of options, uh, I feel very com- more confident. But sometimes when I'm forced to just go and play without any preparation or very little preparation, really good things happen that wouldn't have happened if I'd practiced and prepared. And if we spent a day on each song, you know, and had spent 10 days recording like flex tones, we take our time, you know, we, we record and we, we, we would play it, uh, play a track on the road for a while back before the internet became such a big deal. And, uh, and then we would uh, come in the studio and we would, we would record it for, you know, spend four hours, three or four hours laying down tracks and everybody would leave and I'd cut together a nice version of it. And then everyone would come, come in and, and say, yeah, that's great. Or if I'll let me fix this, that, and boom, we were done. But we'd spend a whole day at it between, yeah. you know, between cutting it and, and, uh, and editing it and then coming back and listening and touching up a, a few things. Um, but, um, you know, I remember making Drive. That was a three-day record. A lot, a lot of records we used to make in the 80s. And they're, they don't suffer for it. Yeah. Well, and it's like you were talking about earlier with the unconscious tapping into that and the instincts relying on that clock on the wall says this record is over. You know, that used to be <laughs> kind of a good pressure sometimes because you're, you, yeah, your unconscious would figure it out. Um, yeah. you'd figure out how to get done. And someone else, someone else once told me that, um, um, a project will take as long as you allot for it. Mm. If you give it two days, you'll get it done in two days. If you give it six months or two years, it will take two years. Yeah. And it, it's not necessarily connected to, um, the quality of it. Yeah. Which is I like that. 
hard to, so someone also once told me a record label guy said there is no correlation between the amount of money put in a budget and the quality of the record that is made. And that's mm. frustrating when you're negotiating, but you know, if it's your own. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice when you're an independent artist. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is a fun conversation, but I'm going to stop us for a second and give you a little reminder. Check that shop.fender.com. I actually happen to be on the website right now. I'm checking out this new player series. I'm looking at this Duo Sonic because it is a nice, shorter scale for anybody who might have smaller hands or even for kids if they're trying to find a guitar that's not quite full scale. Check this thing out, all right? Let's get back to it. Speaking of the flectones and spending time on records, on tours, that sort of thing, a lot of the material with the flectones sounds very complex and the arrangements are long. Many things very through composed, many things like A section, B section, jumping point into improvisation, jumping back into things. And then and it's a journey through the through a lot of the material. How long I, I have a few different questions regarding the material. One do you write out the music? Do you demo it? Do you just make a voice me memo or, you know, uh, some sort of recording of just you playing? Do you just talk through the arrangement of how you want to do things? What kind of prep goes into bringing a new tune to the band? And then how long? Yeah, like you like you said, sometimes you guys worked things out on the road. How long are you normally spending before you're comfortable with something like uh, Big Country or Stomping Grounds or or UFO Tofu, those just being examples. Some of those are different. Have different um, different scenarios because of the kind of music they were. Um, UFO Tofu is is a highly composed piece. Yes, but on the other ones aren't. I'll tell you one of my tricks, and and I kind of kind of comes from um, you know Miles Davis, kind of this non um, non interference kind of strategy, which is to get great people first of all. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Victor's going to be better at coming up with a bass line than I. Actually, I learned this in high school. I I, um, I went to high school with a great bass player named Mar Marcus Miller. Oof. Marcus Miller, right? Yes, of course. He had this amazing jazz band. Omar Hakim was there, and, and Kenny Washington was the drummer. That was your band in high school? Yeah, I grew up in New York City. It was at Music and Art. These guys were all in like the jazz band and the gospel band. And I was just a wannabe, you know. I was I was barely playing the banjo, and and I, but in composition class, they they I was allowed to bring a tune to the jazz band, and so I spent hours, maybe days, writing out a walking bass line for Marcus to play, and I wrote a trumpet line, and you know I I wrote parts for the horn sections for this big jazz band. It was very, it was a big deal. It was hard to do, you know. It was like, was and insane. I brought it in, and the first thing Marcus did was throw away my piece of paper and play whatever he wanted. And I was like, well, that's a bummer. You know, I worked really hard on that, but, yeah. but it taught me something. Um, and, um, and when I got to working and I always heard how Miles was like, would let people do their thing or give them cryptic comments. And I always felt like when you get to a certain level of people, you shouldn't be telling them too much. You should mm -hmm. be allowing them to come up with their thing. So what happened when the Flectone started is first Victor, Victor came to town and, and future man came to town and the three of us would sit around and I would play them these ideas, these tunes that I had written. And I, I knew what chords I thought they were and I knew what, what I wanted and I knew what I, you know, how I counted them in my mind or I could figure it out pretty quick. But I never would say anything. I would just start playing them and they would play along. And a couple of hours later, we'd all be playing it and we'd all really have something good. And every once in a while, Victor might pedal something and I'd go, yeah, do that again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or future man would, I'd say, well, go, go crazy, man. You know, it would be stuff like that. And the thing that I learned is that, um, when you write a piece, you kind of know what you want. You've got something in your head and that doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. If somebody doesn't play that, that's still in your head. But if you tell somebody what to play, they can no longer be a free agent on the piece. Once you say, I need you to play this, 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 and this, their job is to now play what you told them to play. But if you tell them to play whatever they want, they will create their own part that they will own yeah. and they will be proud of and be, it'll become part of the composition. Even if you wrote the melody and the whole, yeah, yeah. the whole thing you wrote the, you know, you, you could teach it to somebody else and still be the same song, but it wouldn't sound the same. And so with the flectones, a lot of the pieces were really, I would say, you know, the arrangement was, was completely, um, in partnership the yeah. original idea came from me and I, I i had plenty of strong ideas and at the end of the day i might say you know i really wish you would play this note here yeah or, but a very often victor would audition a pile of things and then when i'd hear something i liked i'd say man yeah got something there you know 
And, and Future Man always would just play along and find a way. Every once in a while, we would talk about who, how we were counting it, and then we would get stuck in a morass. If we didn't <laughs> talk about it, it always sounded fine. Everyone had figured out a way to make it sound great. And a lot of times, if someone was feeling it in a different way, it made it sound even more syncopated and cool. Hmm. Talk about when you're getting into odd meters. Yeah, like UFO tofu. But Seriously. then in the studio, I would get a little more um, picky. Like that was the time, if we were ever going to have a hard time in, you know, together as a group, it was never the gigs or, cause I was always very loosey goosey about all of that. I wanted everybody to be in process of exploring and finding their own home in each song. But when, uh, when, when we were in the studio, all of a sudden that was the time when I would start to become a tight ass and, and say, Hey, can we get that stop together? You know, or, or, yeah. you know, but I also would be the guy with the final cut cause they would leave and, and in later years and I would do the cut. And I, if somebody did something great, I could pull the take up where I, and so I was basically the curator yeah. of a pile of equal, genius cats yeah and so that was perfectly acceptable way for me to get there without hurting anybody you know without sure um, t- and then um if they didn't like it they could change it you know and they might have a better idea you know when they heard it back they might say oh man i was doing something on that other take and we'd go look and i go oh yeah you're right and then we'd, we'd figure out how to incorporate it um so yeah but live but live uh, th- things would tend to grow into something and get pretty done really yeah. quite done and then then i'd be the picky snot that was trying to make the records you know, sonically, uh, sure. you know, amazing sounding or, or, or perfect, which no one else was actually that concerned about. It might've been better if, if I, if they wasn't so perfect, but I will tell you one funny story about this. Um, there was one point when, you know, we kind of got a rap of, you know, the records being too perfect and, and, you know, we could play like that a lot of the time. It wasn't, it wasn't that much. I, I always thought the records were a rehearsal for the way we wanted to play. And after people listened mm-hmm. to the band, listened to the records for a while, we would play even better than the records. Yeah. Um, so the records were a chance to get the arrangements really right. And then we would learn it. And yeah, we would play it that good, sometimes better, especially a year later. So, but at any rate, one day, uh, Victor and Future Man were like, hey man, this stuff's getting too slick. You know, I said, okay, uh, how do you want to do it different? I said, well, let's not, let's not fix so much. Let's leave a little bit of junk on there. Let's leave it a little dirty. So I said, okay, let's try it. So we went, we did some takes, everybody left. I cut something together. I didn't fix every, you know, I didn't go looking, you know, lining up any notes or trying to get anything slick. You know, I, I left it, you know, kind of rough um, and sounded really good. I said, okay, what do you think about this? And Victor came in and he said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. He said, I just need to fix this, this, and this, and I'll be okay. Said, okay. <laughs> so we patched a few base things. And then future man came in and he said, oh yeah, man, now we're getting there. This is what we're after. And he, uh, he said, but I'm rushing a little bit on that transition. And then this part, I think we should, you know, and so pretty soon we went <laughs> a little while. <laughs> and then same thing with Jeff. And then when they were done, I had I had a few things that I wasn't having. And by the time we were done, then what I discovered is that everybody is much more comfortable with sloppiness if it's not them doing it. Mm. In, in yeah, life. Totally. You're obsessed about your own part and everybody. But so, you know, so that's... There was a lesson to learn there. So we ended up probably with, you know, about the same level of precision that we always got. And I think we learned a lot from having that chance in the studio to get the music, you know, really tight and good. And when we took that, took that with us and with the looseness could be live, we could take it to another level live with precision and looseness. Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, my favorite records are live at the quick and live art. Yeah. (laughs) But I'll tell you what, they sound... They sound to me. I don't. I don't think they're any less tight when I listen to them than the studio records. And maybe that's because there's some sort of subconscious thing when we listen to live records where there's a little more grace. There is grace, but there's also a lot of editing on those records. You know, I I sure. take those records, and I'm the same picky snot that did the other records. And I and yeah. I went through a hundred a hundred shows looking for the glory. Ah. it wasn't one night in one room. Like live at the quick, we did two uh, two shows. I can tell because on the DVD. Everybody is wearing the same outfit except for Vic's shirt. Yes, yes, and that's how you can tell. That's the giveaway. That's the giveaway. <laughs> when I was a teenager, I knew. I know. I figured that out. I remember watching my the first time. I was like, "Wait a minute! This is two different nights." Everybody's Vic gave it away. It wasn't even two different nights. It was two different shows in the same day. And when I saw it, I was like, "Victor, how could you do this?" You know. <laughs> and he said, "I did it on purpose because I want it to be. I think it'll be funny when I suddenly change shows to close in the in the middle of it." And 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 hey, what you know? What do you want? So I was like, okay. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so I did a few edits between two, but I only had two shows to work with and everything had to sure. be real, but it had came yeah. from two shows. I don't have any shame about that. If somebody had a bad, better solo on a different set, I want the be- them to have their best solo, you know? I'm the same way. I think that's great. Between the two shows, you know, 
we've played, we all played that stuff that way, you know? Yeah. So Live in the Quick was, was a two, two album thing. I, I swear I went through every show. And when I heard a magic performance, that was the one that was there. And a lot of times they were too long. So the best part of that performance ended up, you know, being the eight minutes of the track and the, the, mm. the extra, the other three minutes that weren't so good were cut out, you know? So I, I, yeah, I was, and I, I'm less picky now, but um, yeah, that's just the way it is. I want, I, I come from that time, like back when the Beatles, where you waited for the record to come out and it was this, or, or um, uh, who am I thinking of Donald Fagan and, and, you know, a record being amazingly produced was and, and perfect was just as, as exciting as, uh, as anything. It was supposed to be something you worked hard on. So I've always had that F that aesthetic that, that you yeah. work hard on your music and then you release it to the, to the audience. And, uh, and when things got all internet-y and people started recording and, and sharing stuff that, um, you know, wasn't really that good yet. It was really frustrating to me because like when we first played stomping grounds, it wasn't that great, but, but somebody shared it, you know, one of the early performances. And, and, and so I feel like everybody who saw that one would go, Oh yeah, I heard that song. It's not that great. But if they heard us a year later, hmm. it was a whole other world. You know, yeah. not everybody's going to listen to, you know, your performance of something throughout the years. They're going to listen sure. to one. They, they got other things to do. So I always felt you you know put your best foot forward, but I, I'm I'm getting to be dated in that in that, and I'm trying to uh, embrace a new reality. Which, for instance, like this this show Abigail and I are doing every Friday night, we're doing like an hour live performance from our house, yeah, you know, Corona uh, performance basically, uh, which is just on an iPhone and it's just real for yeah. for 50 minutes, and that's that's real. That's what that's what's really going on, and I'm embracing that too. I I, I like that too. There are there different parts of your personality. You get to be the picky ass dude, uh, you know, in the studio, getting it all right. And then when it's time to let loose and play, you just let loose and play. And there, they, it makes you more complete to do both. I think with the flectones, you do a great job of balancing some of those things. There's clear jumping points as a listener where there's certain arranged things and it's very intentional. And I appreciate that knowing how much work went into something, knowing how much how much thought went into something. It's not like, oh, these I paid 50 bucks for the ticket and these guys just come up here and what they didn't even put any thought. It's like, no, I'm <laughs> you know, there's something about that that makes me feel like I'm quote unquote getting my money's worth as a, as a as an audience member. But then also there's those moments, those jumping points where there's improvisation and there's so much freedom where I feel like that's to me where I feel like then because I've gotten all the arranged stuff and all the intentional stuff that now I feel like I'm getting this thing that's so, so special beyond what any record or any other moment could give me other than what's happening right now. And I think that's a fun thing to, to accomplish. Well, that's the, that's the thing that's specific to tonight, to being here now is the improvisations. Cause we do a tune called uh, life in 11 and it's, it's pretty much of a, you know, it's a set piece except for this, the one soloing section is a set piece and it's really hard. And when we pull it off, it's pretty impressive. Um, but that's pretty much the same every night. All of those parts, the hard parts are the same. It's, it's the, it's the free improvising stuff that, that makes a night. That's the night that that happened. That's the night that that yeah. happened. That's, and you go back and you listen, it's got personnel, a personality and a timestamp to that date, you know, cause you don't play it the same and that's, that's really special. So yeah, I, I'm with yeah. you. I'm with you. There's one thing that you kind of glossed over when you were talking about writing and the arranging, and that was having great musicians in the band. You can't just expect everybody to be Marcus Miller or Victor Wooten as far as coming up with bass. That is insane to me. That, that was your man in high school with Omar Hakim and, and Marcus Miller. That's like the dream rhythm section for anybody. Uh, I think Kenny Washington was was the drummer uh, for that jazz band thing, but in, in the composition class, Omar... Uh, Kenny wouldn't do it, and Omar did it for me, and he he was my wow. drummer for my composition class uh, recital. So yeah, that, but that was high school, you know. Yeah, you know, um, incredible. Yeah, but that was just luck because I mean I wasn't ready to play with those guys. I wasn't in sure. the world. But um, but yeah, no, that's an, an amazing thing to me too. That just because of the instrument I play and where I sit in that instrument's story, um, I've been able to play with some of the greatest musicians of the world. And as a representative of the banjo, the banjo ambassador yeah. or, or whatever. And I, I, I take that, high, uh, that, that seriously. I, 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 I'm very proud to be able to represent the banjo, knowing full well that there's a lot of people that do things on the banjo better than me and different from, from me. And there's a lot of flavors. But, but yeah, I've kind of gotten to that point where um, a lot of people think about me. I've been doing it for a long time a certain way. And, and, and I've got a lot of people know about it. And some of the younger players that are, have a lot to offer, haven't got that cred behind them yet, but they will. 
they'll have their time, you know? Yeah. I remember when Thiele came along and it was like, uh, you know, Sam Bush was still around. Yeah. David Grisman was still around. They weren't getting the same attention they got maybe when they first came on the scene, but they were still, you know, getting a ton of attention and, and a lot of love. And, and they did a lot of things that Chris couldn't do. You know, there were things sure. they did that were, Chris would be the first one to say that nobody chops like Sam and nobody has a tone like Grisman. And, you know, so it's, um, you, you start to see it as the years go by, you kind of get to see your place and trying to relax about trying to control or trying to stay at the, at the top position for too long. Someone's going to come along. It's just the way it works. But yeah. to ever be that guy is amazing to me that uh, I'm a new, I'm a New York city guy. I grew up on the upper West side and that, that I'm the banjo guy is just as bizarre to me as it is to anybody else. Well, there's something about being in a band too, that I have a question f- of, for you for, so, because a lot of people that are listening have bands. A lot of people are the, a soul artist, uh, they're the front person and they're hiring a band, that sort of thing. With the Flectones, for years, there was a certain sound and it was the four of you guys with you, Vic, Future Man, and Howard Levy. Actually, shorter than people realize the first band. Oh, really? That was only three years? Jeff Coppin was in the band for like 13 years, but that was, a, but those were different periods for the band and different sounds. Sure. Now, that's where I'm going with it is Howard, incredible harp player, you know, a harmonica player and piano player. Jeff comes in, saxophone player, completely different instrument and approach, but equally compelling. So for those people listening who are maybe thinking about going through a transition period or currently in a transition period, even on the same instrument, if I'm somebody coming into a situation where they had somebody totally different, can you speak to that, how to how to take advantage of who the each individual's voice and then also being that person. How do you as a band leader take advantage of each person's strengths and voice? It's a really good question, man. It's a really good question. And it's a difficult uh, problem for someone who has to replace someone in the band. Cause like, yeah, there were people when Howard left the band, I got calls from harmonica players saying, yeah, I hear you guys are looking for a harmonica player. I said, no, we're not looking for a harmonica player. I'm not going to replace the greatest harmonica player in the world with somebody, you know, who's, uh, who's trying to play like him. You know, I would have to find somebody that was great on something else that, that, that brought a, and it was time for a whole new chapter. Mm-hmm. And I was, and it was, could be anything, could have been any instrument. Honestly, we're just sure. waiting for that person to show up who was of, of that uh, level that, that um, I'm going to try to turn this off again. For some reason I keep turning it off and it just messages just keep coming through. But, um, but, but you know, sometimes you see this with like a big rock band and they lose the lead singer. They find somebody who sings like the lead singer because they, because they can't have that sound without that kind of style of singer or, you know, a certain kind of guitar player has to be replaced with a certain kind of guitar player. And that, that's a little bit, um, um, that's a little bit scared thinking in a way for me. That's like not thinking, not having the confidence in yourself to think you can do it again, come up with another good combination. Sure. Uh, I mean, the first thing I would say is it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to change the music and not be stuck because mm-hmm. bands get stuck. Yeah. And so when Jeff Coppin left uh, to go um, play with uh, Dave Matthews band after he'd been with us for 13 years, 14 years, whatever, um, in a way, it was an opportunity for the band to become unstuck. We were stuck in a great way with Jeff. A long time. He stayed there a long time because he was great for the band, but it was getting harder to think of what to do next. We'd mm-hmm. done a lot of stuff over the course of, I think, seven records with him, or five, whatever it was. And um, um, so when he left, all of a sudden, it was Pandora's box. We could do anything. And when Howard came back, I was not the first person to, to, to jump at that idea because I thought, here's a chance for us to go in a whole new direction. But the guys said, no, let's try with Howard again. And we, we found that it was, it was just so great to play with him again. It was, just, it was the original plan of the band. So I actually had to change my thinking to get back on board with it because the other guys felt really strongly. And, and I tried to be flexible and discovered that, again, that it was just a joy to play yeah. with Howard and to rediscover that, that feeling. But it, to me, it is more of a, a continuation of the first three years of the band than a new thing. Hmm. Um, and to do a new thing, something pretty pretty serious has to change because it's the same guys on the same instruments. Um, so, but I do that in other places in my life and I've got enough new things going on and the flectones rather than being what it once was where it's like all about what new thing we can deliver. It's more of a celebration of what we've managed, managed to arrive at and where we can jump off from there. Yeah. Um, so it's not like it's uh, don't, don't get me wrong. It's the best band I have ever played with. It's the best musicians I've ever played with. I love it. 
Um, but it's but we're not in a creative growth spurt. We're in a different we're in a different point. And there may be a time when we decide let's get together and spend another year, um, you know, creating new music and touring it uh, rather than getting together for a month at a time or or three weeks here and there yeah. over the course of a year in which we play the old material and and we're, we basically explore our back catalog. When mm-hmm. we go out on tour, we find a few tunes that we've never done with Howard, maybe from the Jeff days. We pull out some tunes we haven't done yet um, from the old, old days with Howard. And we take them the, the songs to the moon spontaneously. There's something very freeing about not having the pressure to reinvent the wheel every single time the band gets together too, which is against every instinct in my body. When we started, I was like, I don't want to do the Flectones unless we're going to tour for two years and create brand new music and show up with, a, you know, with because the band was so idealistic. So it's taken a... A shift for me to get on board, but I, I'm very happy that it's part of all of our lives. Yeah. I mean, you had a record, was it Little Worlds, the one with 30 songs on it? It was a triple album, yeah. Yeah. That is incredible. To think about the amount of material that you guys do have to draw from is is insane. And especially if you consider the material that Howard, because he was on three albums and that was it. So there's, you know, 30-ish, 30 to whatever songs with Howard and the songs we didn't record with Howard. Sure. And then there's probably 50, a hundred that came from after. And a lot of those would sound great with him. And we've discovered sound great with him. And, and, yeah. uh, but then he has a lot of work to do on those. He's got to learn them. We've got to find a whole new part for him. And it's, it's, it's a different experience. But the fact that future man and I and Victor and I are all still playing together to me, that's because Howard left, that has become the constant that makes something a Flectone record. If mm-hmm. Howard had stayed, it would be all four of us. But since he left and we had all, all these years without him, um, we, we managed to be, continue to be a band and have different looks at what the band That's is. That's great. I have a quick question about uh, most of the music and settings you play in are with acoustic instruments, which can be kind of hard to amplify and can be hard to make sound natural and good in larger environments, amphitheaters, large clubs, venues. What's your approach these days? Do you like to mic and DI, do one or the other? Where, where's the compromise? There's always a compromise with micing acoustic instruments. Where are you at right now with that? Are the the Flectones are the only band that I plug in with these days in terms of playing an electric solid body instrument. And I play yeah. that on, some, on, you know, I don't know, a, a third or a, something, maybe a little more than a third of the Flectones music, I'll play my electric and yeah. I might as well be a guitar player, really, in terms of the sound I'm getting, except that I'm using the banjo technique and the banjo tuning. And there are some things that yeah. I get out of that, um, that, that. And it gives the band a different color for those songs. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I have a very elaborate system with the Flectones um, where I have the banjo. I play it through a certain amp that I think sounds really good. But I have basically a PA um, EQ on it, like a Lake um, um, electronic uh, EQ that can do, um, not only can it do, um, you know, unlimited bands of parametric equalization, it also can uh, align different signals. So, you know, when you have speaker alignment, you have speakers at different distances at a festival yep. you have to align the, 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 the timing between them. Well, I do that with the banjo mic that I have on board and my pickup, which would be a slightly out of phase yeah. uh, unless I delay the mic slightly. Sure. And th- and that makes it a, a really good electric sound. And then I sound, I sound, um, a very EQ'd, uh, highly EQ'd sound to the band on stage so they can run it through the monitors without it feeding back. But in the headphones, I have the fat, rich sound that I want to hear. Yeah. Um, so then with Abigail, we do a very minimalist kind of thing. We have these tiny little speakers that are about this big that are like little tiny monitors that we put on a stick by our ears. And we, we use pickups, but, but just very, very low level. And because it's up by our ears, um, yeah. it doesn't have to be loud at all. And we're usually playing theaters, you know, between, you know, 500 and 2000 seaters. Yeah. And, uh, and even at festivals, we've discovered we can play just fine because, because it's just only two instruments. Yeah. We're hearing a lot next to each other, even in, in, and then even in very, very large places, we find we can play just great. And my favorite part of this show is when we go, um, without all that, we just go up to a, a stand up mic and she sings on it, and a sit down mic, which is a nice fathead, um, ribbon mic and yeah. no pe- no uh, monitors at all. And we can hear each other right next to each other. And the sound coming back from the house is like a nice delayed sound. Yeah. We can stay together and it's the best banjo sound I ever get live because it's just a, it's a great mic and no monitors. Yeah. Messing up the sound. So, you know, every situation I'm in, I have to assess what's the sound plan going to be. And I usually have a pretty strong sense of what I want to do 
I'm going to be taking out a bluegrass band out for the first time in a long time. And we're going to use headphones and really nice mics. Nice. But we can have that, in, that immediate response that you want to have in bluegrass where you're really tight. But once you put, put that in loud monitors, uh, it's going to feed back. It's going to sound terrible. So yep. then you, get, you get the best of both, both worlds. You get really nice miking and really tight playing. Um, and the downside is you've got stuff, stuff, something stuck in your ears, which we don't have to do with Abby. Yeah, when I play with Sakir and Edgar. We use those small monitors too, those on, little ones on sticks, and we try and make it as as acoustic as possible. And playing with Abby again, we have really nice mics, but we also have pickups. Yeah, and some of those instruments we play are very low, like cello banjos, um, like this. It's a it's a big cello banjo, right? And and so it's not that loud. But once you put a pickup on it, it fills the sound of a of a bass, you know, yeah. or a cello. But if you just played on a mic, it would be very, very soft. And, and sure. so we, we take advantage of that to get a big sound yeah. on certain songs with me and Abby. Well, I feel like there's been a lot of really great conceptual artistic talk on this. I feel like I've learned a lot. Some guitar players might think, well, give me some practical logistical things. So before we leave, one thing that I think a lot of guitar players don't always focus on, but all of us could learn from is finger picking patterns and finger picking technique in general. Is there some sort of exercise that you like to practice as far as gaining control technique? Obviously certain things are different on the banjo, but you're picking strings and you're fretting frets. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot in common with the guitar. For, for me, I think of the banjo as a percussion instrument, you know? And so uh, when I'm playing with my fingers, I'm trying to get them to play as tightly as a drummer would play or uh, a marimba player or whatever. And, and I'm really, I, I, I really use my metronome. Uh, and, I, and when I practice with the metronome and I'm trying to you know, work on my timing, which I, is a, always a work in progress, there's times when my timing gets really strong and times when I have to whip it back into shape. Um, locking with a metronome as if it was a great drummer you were playing with and making every single note even is something that you know, is helpful on any instrument. You don't want to turn into a machine, but once you start playing with the fingers, you can float on the top or you can make the time. Mm -hmm. And when you make the time, the great banjo players, if you listen to J.D. Crow on um, the old Home Place album, the, 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 the great um, bluegrass album he made with Ricky Skaggs and Tony Rice, and you listen to the, the way he creates the time, it's, he's not playing along with anybody. It's just like the greatest drummer you ever heard. And the way Earl Scruggs could play, there's, some, there's a power to um, really good timing um, that is, uh, sometimes you can slough, slough that off a little bit when you're playing in a band uh, and you're playing with drums. You can just sort of lean on the drummer and, and if it's a little loose, it's fine. In a bluegrass band or a small a duet situation, um, or in a lot of musical situations, being super precise, not in a picky way, but in a very rhythmic way, has a power to it. And I hear guitar players that finger pick that are able to get that. And I think that's something worth pursuing, having it not just be sort of a, an add-on, loosey-goosey, okay, I want to, you know, when I grab the, the pick and play along with a couple of fingers, you know, I see people do that and some people do it kind of, I don't know how to put it, um, almost like they're looking down on it a little bit. Like, what about making that into like a really tight technique? Like really yeah. thinking about playing with a sense of time when you do that, that's, um, it's very tight and see what that gives you, especially with a funk pattern or something like that. I mean, think oh. about the way the funksters play. Um, and some people play with their fingers and thinking about Jeff Beck, for instance, yeah. um, but Victor Wooten just playing with his fingers. It's not really about the banjo. It's about learning to use your fingers. Like they're almost like drumsticks. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you joining us. And uh, it's a really treat to hear about your process and your journey in, in making records and that sort of thing. So uh, we really appreciate it. Let me plug a couple of things just because I'm here and maybe yeah. some really interesting. Tell us what you're working on. Um, well, Abigail and I are doing an every Friday uh, performance um, at uh, 7 o'clock Eastern time on, on, my, on my site at an hour straight through. It's called Banjo House Lockdown. As, you know, I, I don't know. We're, we're hoping we'll do it through the whole experience. Yeah. Uh, but also there's a reissue of, uh, of this uh, Throw Down Your Heart project that, uh, of my trip to Africa where I played with all, all the African musicians and a, and a brand new CD with uh, Tumani Diabate, who's a great core player that just, just came out this last week. And uh, so I just want to let you know about those. And then there'll be a, a brand new bluegrass project with a lot of the great players of the time coming in, in, uh, in this, late in the summer, hopefully. Yes. And I can vouch for that. The record and the, the video concept of it 
it's cool because I, I didn't realize the history of the banjo and the connection with Africa. I learned a lot. Not only is it really great music, it's a great learning experience, and you've done a great service of an ethnographic study of the banjo and its history with Africa and, and the way that you, you, you're playing with the musicians in that, from that region. It, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate it. So that that's t- like a 10 or 12 year old project, but now it's new again because there's a version of it that we just put out with like all the music. There's two now two albums, the movie, um, an hour of extra footage and a brand new album from with me and, and Tumani. So it's exciting to get that music back out because it, it I had a 10 year license on it and it, it came to an end and then it just wasn't out anymore. It's one of the sure. one of the things I'm really proud of. So I'm glad it's back out there and with with new new life, too. Another duet record. I love it. Yeah, keep on coming. <laughs> well, well, maybe we'll have to do some guitar and banjo together someday. How about that? Plan on it. All right. Yeah, banjos. You could learn to play the banjo. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like, like you said, you need to have somebody who doesn't do what you do. <laughs> All right, man. I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you so much. There we go. Bela Fleck, innovator, creator. And I don't want to put too much pressure on him, but I would say genius. This guy is so good at what he does, and that was really great insight. I gained a lot from it, so I hope you guys did too. Thank you so much for joining us, and I got to give a little plug at the end here. If you are not familiar with my music, or if you already are familiar and just want to find out more places that you can listen to it, check me out. I got new music on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Google, you know, all the places that you listen to music these days. I got a bunch of new music I've been putting out the last few months. I'm going to continue putting out more new music the next couple months because I can. This time of lockdown and quarantine, I've spent a lot of time writing and recording. And that's, I guess, the silver lining of this whole thing. So check it out. Let me know what you think. Thanks.